Welcome to St. Edward's on this Patty's Day. Top of the morning to you. <laughs> um, my name is Kay Dean, and Shannon is away this week, and uh, she has prepared the service for Sue King Darby and myself uh, to uh, present to you and to preside. Uh, there will also be a sermon done by video of um, another ministry colleague. So uh, we do welcome you here this morning. So welcome to our church, where all are embraced with love and acceptance. Here, diversity is celebrated, and everyone's unique journey is honored. Whether you come with joy or burdens, you are cherished just as you are. Join us in building a community where kindness and understanding thrive. Welcome home. Now this morning, there are several announcements, both in the bulletin and otherwise. The first one I want to mention, on the back of the bulletin, there is a, a dedication of the bulletin. In loving memory of my parents, uh, George and Francis, Francis Gillespie, from daughter Pamela Tonnery. And also um, on the back, there's a note about the Broadview Magazine subscription. And then uh, this Friday, March the 22nd at 6.30 p.m., we are all invited to join the youth group for a family fun movie night with popcorn and hot out of the oven cookies. Please sign up on the bulletin board or let the office know if you are coming. And let's see, um, don't forget about Easter morning breakfast. It's uh, the last day and the last Sunday of March. Uh, after the early morning service, there will be a breakfast and people are invited and encouraged to bring muffins and hot cross buns if they uh, would like and uh, to let the office know that if they're able to, to bring some. And let's see. Let's see, what else have I got here? Oh yes, Maxine, would you like to come forward uh, for an announcement from UCW? Top of the morning to you. <laughs> Our UCW are currently collecting items for the third place transition, transition house. I understand that you, the congregation, are interested in helping us donate some items. Speaking to the person in charge this week, they would like items of toiletries, face cloths, and towels. We will be delivering on April the 15th. So if you wish to donate, please bring them to the church or a member of the UCW by Sunday, April the 14th. Thank you very much for your support, and if you have any questions, you can Check with a UCW or moi. And one final announcement by a, a special guest. Sharon, are you ready? Come on. Well, everybody else said top of the morning, and that was my line. But anyway, top of the morning to all of you. I have been wondering for quite a while why we celebrate St. Patrick's Day. And our sign out front says Google doesn't know everything, but I trusted Google to give me the right answer this time. So I'm passing it along to you. St. Patrick, who lived in the fifth century, is a patron saint of Ireland and its national apostle. But he was not born in Ireland. He was born in Roman Britain, wherever that is. He was kidnapped when he was 16 years old by the Irish and brought to Ireland and worked as a slave. Later, he escaped. Then, later on, he kept thinking that he really had a calling to go back to Ireland. He loved the people, he loved the land, so he went back to Ireland. And he is credited with bringing Christianity to its people. In the 29 years, that he was their apostle. He was responsible for establishing over 300 churches. In the centuries that followed, 
Pat uh, Patrick's death, and he was believed to have died on March 17, 461. The mytholo mytho mythology surrounding his life became even more ingrained in the Irish culture. Perhaps the most well-known legend of St. Patrick is that he explained the shamrock as the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit because of the three leaves of their shamrock, the clover. He also, and in Ireland, they celebrate, that, that during Lent, the Irish people are not allowed to have meat. That's what they give up for their Lent. But on March 17th, that is banned. They're allowed to have meat, and they would go to church in the morning. They'd dance all afternoon, and then in the evening or supper time, they would have what we call our corned beef and cabbage, but they called it bacon and cabbage is what they had. So this tradition has carried on. It's all over the world now. Everyone all over the world celebrates it. Uh, Florida was the first place out of Ireland that celebrated, and then it moved on to New York, and then it just kept coming to Canada. And so that's a little information about our, our St. Patrick. So I don't know if I'm Irish or not. I have no idea, but I'm celebrating him today. And as you know, I like to celebrate every occasion. Now, the real reason I'm here, I'm here on behalf of the pastoral care team. And next Sunday is our newcomer's luncheon. This is the last invite, so you better think about it. Uh, it's at, right after church on Sunday morning next week. And we'd love to see faces there and many faces that believe that they're new or have been new in the last few years are more than welcome. But if you would tell Wendy or one of our greeters on the way out if you plan to come, because we have to decide, you know, if we need 10 sandwiches or 100. So we would love to know if you would like to come and if you are planning to bring someone with you. So thank you very much for listening. Let us now uh, have a, a centering song for worship as the sun with longer journey. We gather this morning on land that is known as Nova Scotia and traditionally as one of the districts of Mi'kma'ki. This land has, has known many names, many peoples, many generations. In honor of all who have come before us, may we never forget that the history of this land didn't begin with us. There are many sacred stories linked to this place in hope that all the people after us may know the true history of this land, may we weave these stories into our lives as people who call this place home. We are all sacred people, beloved children of the Holy One, and we are treaty people who recognize our relationship is based on peace and friendship. May we treat one another as such in truth and reconciliation. And now please join me in the responsive call to worship. Why are you here? I see it. You're in the right place. God is here. The door is open to you. Why are you here? I am seeking God with my whole heart, with my entire mind, and with a fire burning in my bones. We see that in you. You're in the right place. God is here. The door is open to you. 
Let us worship God. Let us learn from the Spirit. Amen. And now our lighting of the Christ candle. As we light this candle today, we remember and honor the sacred fires around which First Nations people have gathered for thousands of years to receive stories of the Creator from their elders. We gather around this light to receive the faith stories of our ancestors. May we find the light of Christ here in our worship and in our hearts. Please join me in a moment of sacred silence to prepare ourselves for worship. And let us pray. Teaching God, we want to learn your ways. We want to learn the ways of forgiveness. We want to learn the ways of grace. We want to learn your ways of love. That is part of why we return to your text week after week, because we are hungry to be more like you. So as we prepare to listen to your good word, calm the noise in our minds. Center our spirits to focus on you so that we might learn and hear what we have missed in this story before. God, we want to learn your ways. Meet us here. Speak your truth. Help us listen. Amen. When the winter wind blows from more voices. Let us hear an enactment uh, from our sacred story. Peter is often all or nothing, either resisting Jesus or drawing closer to him in earnest. In this scripture, we see a version of Peter who is hungry to learn. His posture is humble and open. He wants to absorb Jesus' teachings like a wet sponge. He asks a question and might expect a, a straightforward answer. How many times should I forgive? Now, hearing our sacred story from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18. This is what you do if one of your siblings sins against you. Go to them in private and tell them just what you perceive the wrong to be. If they listen to you, you've won a sibling, but sometimes they will not listen. And if they do not listen, go back, taking a friend or two with you. Then if your sibling still refuses to heed, you are to share what you know with the entire church. And if your sibling still refuses to listen to the entire church, you are to cast out your unrepentant sibling and consider, consider them no different from outsiders and tax collectors. Remember this, whatever you prohibit on earth will be prohibited in heaven and what you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. And I tell you more, 
if two or three of you come together as a community and discern clearly about anything, my heavenly parent will bless that discernment. For when two or three gather together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Lord, when someone has sinned against me, how many times ought I forgive him? Once, twice, as many as seven times? You must forgive not seven times, but 70 times seven. Love your neighbor and forgive. Words so simple yet so hard. We have wounds because we've lived. Calluses unfold our hearts. Jesus reaches out to touch wounds and hearts that hold too much sounds of bombs and bullets ring war is all we've ever known pacifists are framed as weak we rely on might alone jesus pays the paths of peace even as the threats increase. Love is risky, peace is faint, and forgiveness feels naive. All are sinners, all are saints, and we all God's grace receive. So we follow mercy's way, softening our hearts to grace. Good morning. We have been hearing stories shared by Dr. Terence Lester during Lent. He leads a nonprofit called Love Beyond Walls in Atlanta, Georgia. Terence brings our scripture to life by sharing stories about the people he has connections with through his nonprofit. Today, Peter asked Jesus, How many times do we need to forgive someone? And Jesus says, you must forgive not seven times, but 70 times seven. That's a lot of times, isn't it? Let's hear a story about someone who took Jesus' advice to keep forgiving very seriously. Terence met Leonard rummaging through the trash at a gas station for what he called lunch. Leonard said, I lost my wife, I couldn't cope, I ended up outside. And for a little over six months, this has been my life. Terence isn't sure what prompted him to ask the follow-up question, but he asked Leonard, Leonard, if you had one wish, what would it be? Without hesitation, Leonard responded, I wish I could be made over. Leonard wasn't yearning for a new house or a list of material possessions. He longed for a shower and a change of clothes. Many unhoused people often lack basic amenities like running water and grooming services. Two weeks before this conversation, Love Beyond Walls had been do donated a 30-passenger bus. And there it is on the screen. A campaign was started that mobilized hundreds of people to transform this old bus into a mobile barber shop, clothing closet, and hygiene station. 
Terence reached out to local barbering schools and met Jamel, who was 27 and had just earned his license. He volunteered at Beyond, Love Beyond Walls almost every week. One day, Terence asked him why he volunteered. Jamel replied, my dad is unhoused, and I haven't seen him since I graduated 10 years ago. I don't know where he is, and I'm just hoping that one day I'll run into him. Jamel did run into his father. Terence says, I will never forget their embrace. We actually saw a video about Jamel's father a couple weeks ago. His name is Mark, and Terence met him when a neighbor complained that he was digging through the dumpster. Jamel ended up giving his father a makeover on the streets. His dad had no idea that his son had become a barber, but it became a turning point for him. He entered a program graduated from it, found work as a chef, and now has his own apartment. Forgiveness happened through an act of faith on Jamel's part. His father wasn't there for him for 10 years, but Jamel's desire to repair the relationship remained strong. This encounter was changed for both Jamel and his father, Mark, because of Jamel's willingness to follow Jesus' advice to keep on forgiving, Mark and Jamel's lives improved so much. If there's any Spirit Quest folk in the uh, congregation, uh, you'll be invited to stay here until worship is over. And next week, Spirit Quest will begin again. Let us join in our call to confession. Friends, when you study Peter's story in scripture, it's almost impossible to ignore how much he loved to ask questions. He asked Jesus, what does the parable mean? Where are you going? How many times should we forgive? Like a tenacious toddler, Peter was full of questions because Peter was eager to learn. So friends, let us be like Peter. Let's return to Christ with the humility of a student as we pray together the prayer of confession. Let this be a moment of learning. Let us pray. Holy God, we long to be lifelong learners. Instead, we often live as if we know best. We forget that the disciples called you rabbi, teacher. Like Peter, who was brave enough to ask, how many times should we forgive? Make us brave. With hope and humility, we pray. Amen. Family of faith, when Peter asked Jesus, how many times should I forgive? Jesus responded with abundance. That abundance exists for you as well. No matter what you have done or left undone, no matter what lessons you have learned or are still learning, God's abundant grace exists for you. God's love will never run out. So hear and rest in this good news. You are forgiven. You are loved. You are invited to serve. Thanks be to God. Amen.
morning, we're very pleased and grateful to have Donna Turner give the message today via video. Donna, as you see on the screen, is the minister at Trinity United Church in New Glasgow. She's also part of the group that, who plans services together in the local area, which includes St. Andrew's Church. So it's just another way for the churches to collaborate and share their expertise and resources. So we're very grateful to Donna and would like to say hi to her, wouldn't we? But I'll, we'll do that another time. Good morning, friends at St. Andrews in Truro. Good morning, friends Thank at St. Andrews in Truro. Thank you for inviting me to share a little bit of Thank you for inviting me to share a little bit of this worship service with Shannon. A little bit while she's having a week away and to have an extra chance to offer this message. Have an extra chance to offer this message. Before I start, though, I want to say thank you also for the warm welcome that I received when I visited your congregation back in the fall. It was one of the few places where I felt truly welcomed and warmly received. Partly because I was met with a smile and a hello as soon as I walked in the door. Uh, hello. Uh, somebody I noticed I was a visitor and made the uh, made a point of a visitor, saying we're happy you're here. Made a point and also because I sat with a lovely woman at the and back. Also because of I the, sat with a lovely woman at the of, back the of the congregation, and uh, we shared a really nice and morning uh, in worship. We shared so a really nice morning I very much appreciated being there, so and I very much yeah, being asked being to say to yeah, offer a few moments of reflection this morning. Offer a few moments of reflection this morning. Start with a moment of prayer. Start with a moment of prayer. God of love. God We're of so love. grateful that every once in a while so we are reminded every once in a while of the reason why we of the play reason the Christ. Why we play and today the message in the gospel Today, gives the us pause to think about where forgiveness fits in the core values of our We're faith. In the core values of We're so grateful that we have Peter. We're so grateful who doesn't always get it right. Peter. So that then we can also see where we might be corrected and work harder to understand what it means to be a father. May your spirit be upon us and inspire us. Be upon us in the name of Jesus. And inspire us. So it's the first Sunday of Lent. We've been Sunday traveling with Peter these past few weeks and getting a closer look at who he is and how he grows his faith. We see ourselves in some of those things that Peter says and does, even when he has the best of intentions. Even when he has the best Peter seems to be on the receiving end of some pretty key teachings, don't you think? Teachings that have remained central to the Christian message. We've seen Peter enthusiastically join a band of fishers and follow Jesus to fish for people. We've seen Peter witness the, the idea or the vision of Christ walking towards him on the water and impulsively jump out to go and meet him and then shift his focus and we watched him sink into the sea only to be offered a hand from Jesus. We've seen Peter enthusiastically. We've heard his response to the question that he asks, that Jesus asks him about who people say he is. We've heard Peter declare that you are the Messiah. And from a distance, we listen to Jesus in one moment praise, read Peter, for being the rock upon whom the church will be built, and then in the next moment say, get behind me, Satan, because Peter thinks he knows better about who the Messiah is and what will happen to the Messiah and what is expected as, as uh, one of his followers. So today we have another important image of Peter, one of Peter as a student, the one who tries so hard to get it right, but misses the mark, thinking he's giving a generous number and his response to his own question, how many times should one forgive? Seven times? 
I mean, think about it, seven times. That's a lot of times to forgive someone. And then Jesus says, not seven, but 77 or 70 times seven, however you understand or interpret that phrase to be. In other words, too many times to count. So Peter, don't do the math. Just keep forgiving. Forgiveness is at the core of our faith. Loving our neighbor, seeing the holy in each other, recognizing that we're all created in God's image. Those are difficult teachings. But we've all been at this long enough to know that sometimes the hardest thing to do is to forgive someone. When I was in seminary, I remember being asked by one of my professors to write a little essay about what you could imagine to be the most difficult day in ministry. And honestly, I thought of all kinds of scenarios that would be very difficult to deal with. But for me, the hardest one is being personally wounded by someone I trust. So feeling betrayed or something like that. So when you're betrayed, of course, you need to forgive. And that's, that's a hard thing. You, you can probably all think of situations where that was a hard, hard thing to do. We hold our hurts so deeply, don't we? And forgiving once is hard enough, but forgiving repeatedly, well, in some cases, that is just sets us up for being used, you know, being a sucker and falling for it again. We can probably all think of times when this verse and this teaching was used negatively to keep victimizing the victim and I seriously don't think that that is what Jesus intends here. I've been thinking about sometimes when I've heard folks tell stories uh, about situations that they could not forgive. Even, even I've seen brothers who have lived their whole adult lives not being able to forgive each other for something that happened early in life and not being able to live into that relationship of brothers because neither one of them was willing to budge. But let's be clear, when you can't forgive, who do you really think is being hurt? When you can't forgive, you begin to be the one to carry the grudge, to hold something cold and hard within you. The person who's harmed you has probably walked away and forgotten about the incident, but there you are, churning the incident over again and again in your mind. There's no resolve, and still, it rekindles your anger every time you remember. How is that feeling contributing positively to your life? Hmm. Perhaps the instruction to forgive seven times 70 is for us personally, not for the benefit of, of the other. So that every time that feeling comes up when you remember the incident, you have to move to forgiveness again. You have to get to that place again where you, where you get past a grudge and offer um, the benefit of the doubt to that person or an opportunity for a clean slate or a fresh start. That moment leads to compassion and later understanding because you know there's always another side to the story. And when we begin to say, what I experienced is my experience, what you experienced is your experience, and somewhere in the middle, there's probably room for both of us to understand, then you're beginning to understand what it means to forgive. When we think about the central importance of this teaching for the Christian church, it's not difficult to find examples of why this is important. Without forgiving ourselves and our ancestors, we cannot move any closer to reconciliation in the many attitudes that have produced so much harm over the life of the church. Apologies, after all, are tied closely with forgiveness, and true apologies result in changed behavior. I'm going to tell you a couple of stories. Last Sunday, 
I had the absolute joy of spending a few hours at a birthday party. It's rare that I get invited to a birthday party for a three-year-old, let me tell you, mostly as a minister. I'm invited to celebrate and mark big milestones like when somebody turns 90 and there's flowers presented or you know when there's a hundredth birthday and the minister needs to show up because that's really important to somebody maybe not even the hundred year old but somebody but i got to be with five couples and their ten little kids i played with the kids a bit i spent some lovely time with the birthday girl who is my absolute joy and i had a conversation with her dad that has been with me all week this family lived in New Glasgow for a few years and connected with Trinity while they were there, but they have since moved to Dartmouth. I miss them so much. They were one of those families that gave me sort of hope that there could be a connection with more people their age. And, you know, that this was a family that were connectors. And so it's difficult for me to see them leave. But our, con our conversation was about finding a faith community in the new location. And we quickly moved to problems with the church for his generation. They have no history of the pain and division that occurred in communities a hundred years ago when families split over church union. They just see churches that are empty and close to each other. And why would there be so many empty churches when pooling resources makes so much more sense? They are far enough removed from the deeply held narratives based on prejudice and pride that kept young people from marrying someone in another denomination. Like beginning, like the beginning of the healthcare system in Canada, I heard this statistic on uh, CBC radio morning programs a couple of weeks ago, that the health, the health system is broken because it was created for 27 year olds because that was the average age of the person of people in Canada when it was created and I thought that's exactly where the church is the church is broken in some ways because it was created for the 27 year olds and their children and their parents and the generations were closer together and more connected through for through communities of faith and we've just moved from that space so our conversation moved from uh, the place where we make assumptions based on gender and age and ethnicity and values of the leaders of the day to a place where he said, but I think the United Church cares about the things that young people care about, people my age care about. So I want to think that there's something there, but the church hasn't caught up with how to communicate with my generation. What we're asking for is not forgiveness from God in this case, but forgiveness from our children who were raised in the church and have since rejected it because we haven't been able to see how people evolve in communities and, and new insights lead to new loyalties. He said, we've looked around. The United Church is the only one that seems to speak out of humility. They say that they care about the things my generation cares about. The environment, gender equality, human rights, inclusiveness, those who are vulnerable, relations with Indigenous people, and yet the Church seems to be stuck in its way of delivering the message and being heard. People my age are not interested in the package. They have had such negative experiences with the Church. I take those comments personally, you know? I feel kind of beaten up even because I know so many good people who continue to be the church. I obviously have invested deeply in the institution and in making a difference. It is 34 years, 34 years since I entered the payroll of the United Church of Canada, first as a lay minister and then later as an ordained minister. But I admit the guy is right. The institution of the Christian church has a lot to seek forgiveness for 
with so very few ways to have that conversation. The ones we need to speak with are not easily accessible, but we must keep trying the spiritual questions are still there. The not yet five-year-old who was present in our congregation last week posed these questions to her mother as she was listening to the service. Mom, why do we belong to God? What does Amen mean? Does God care about us? Where is God? And when her mother tried to answer, but why is God everywhere? Those are important questions from a child who has not yet been tainted negatively by the world. These are the questions that the church can help her with if we're honest about our lifelong need to wrestle with them ourselves. May we be forgiven for spending too much time worrying about which China to use and who's in and who's out. But let's get real with these core teachings of Jesus, building relationships that support rather than exclude and allowing ourselves to take a close look at what we are guarding, our assumptions and our stuff. The impact of Jesus' life has been felt by those who embrace his teachings for 2,000 years. I believe the world still needs this approach and believe that as we transition over the next period, when we release our grip on old ideas and ways of being the church, we might just possibly be bearers of the sacred story evident in our actions and in our relationships. You know, there's always a place to share the good news, which strangely enough shows up in most of our relations, most often in our relationships. As humans, we are hardwired to connect with each other, to exist in families and communities, to interact with people who will no doubt disappoint us and maybe betray us, which makes the work of forgiveness something that we need to keep on being vigilant about. The ripple effect is seen in the world beyond us, nations fighting over control of resources, or who have, or who has the correct story, sacred story, or which ideologies are going to win. Nobody can hear the other side, the opposing point of view, and so no, the only solution that anybody can ever see is to use more power and more force. I hear the plea from the young father for spiritual influence for his children, for a community that gathers around goodness and building a better world. Take heart, people of faith. Just because we don't have it all figured out yet doesn't mean that our work is finished. Perhaps there has never been a more important time for us to share our work with the world around us and a time that is more needed. I know you're doing good work. Keep it up. People are watching and it matters. Amen.
stand and sing the hymn, Because You Came, from More Voices, number 64. Our global mission story is a local mission story this morning. Uh, it is about our library. Um, Sue, uh, myself, and Ardeth Christie um, work as a team in keeping the library as organized as we can, along, uh, with the books and many puzzles. And I'm sure you've all seen it, but I'd like to ask, how many of you have borrowed a book from our library? Wow, good. That's great, thank you. There here are a couple of things you might not know. <clears throat> Excuse me. First, the beautiful and sturdy books, bookshelves rather, were built by Ron Laking and Glenn Ross using the wood from our beloved pipe organ. Ron also made the donation box, which is on the hall, or the wall rather, toward the coat room. So a big thank you goes to them. There is no requirement to pay for the books as you borrow them or the puzzles. However, a small donation is welcome. All proceeds from the library go directly to support the Benevolent Fund. So these funds are greatly appreciated. The Benevolent Fund is that, that fund that uh, the minister has to help those in special needs that come through our door. Second, the books are alphabetically organized by the last name of the author. We mostly have novels, but we have some spiritual religious books, some devotionals, a few craft books, cookbooks, gardening books, uh, children's books, and some magazines. And there are some ideals, um, if you remember those seasonal ideals, uh, reflective books are there as well. So we welcome any questions or suggestions to make this a bit more user-friendly. We would like to thank this community for donating all of the secondhand books and puzzles. It grew organically without much um, push or organization on anybody's part. It's absolutely wonderful. So this gives us a lot of variety and sometimes when we have too many of one particular title, for example, we will uh, send some books up the hill to Joan Thompson, who organizes a, a library at Parkland. Or we may take a few over to New to You at Steps. So we're doing not just for ourselves, but a couple of other places as well. And since April of 2022, we have raised over $307, and that goes toward the benevolent fund of our church. So folks, happy reading and happy puzzle making.
And now let us offer a dedication prayer towards our offering. Let us dedicate our offering to God's use. Holy God, we dedicate our lives to you, loving and forgiving and giving God. May our offerings in whatever form contribute to the healing of the world and in spreading of the gospel. Amen. Let us come to God in prayer as we give our prayers of the people. God of all seasons, in your pattern of things, there is a time for keeping and a time for losing, a time for building up and a time for pulling down. In this holy season of Lent, as we journey to the cross, help us to discern in our lives what we must lay down and what we must take up what we must end, and what we must begin. Give us the grace to lead a disciplined life in glad faithfulness and with the joy which comes from a closer walk with Jesus, just as Peter did. In this time of inner reflection, we pray that the earth might be freed from war, famine, and disease, and that the air, soil, and waters be cleansed of pollutants. We pray that those who govern and maintain peace in every land may exercise their powers in accordance with your will. We pray that you will strengthen our nation in pursuit of justice so that all people may be reconciled, the young educated, the aging cared for, the hungry filled the homeless housed, and the sick comforted and healed. May your spirit rest on those who live and work in our county of Colchester, our town of Truro, and our church community here at St. Andrews, giving peace and safety to all. And together we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father and Mother who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And let us stand and join in singing our closing hymn, Jesus Christ is Waiting.
place. May you carry your curious heart on your sleeve. May you look for God in every face. May you find the courage to get out of the boat, to run to the tomb, and to speak of your faith. And when the world falls apart, may you hear God's voice deep within saying, Take heart, it is I, be not afraid. You are called, you are blessed. In both your ups and your downs, you always belong to God. Go now in peace. Go trusting that good news. Amen. Praise be given to the maker of the season's cheery round. To the speaker through the spoken in their living breath of love as the ever turns.